Hi, I'm uh, Ornaldo Giorgi from uh, Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso and in this episode of our data literacy podcast we are going to talk uh, about uh, data and uh, public administrations. So uh, many uh, stress how data is the oil of the 21st century and there are uh, various sources of data. Of course, big tech companies uh, Uh, produce and uh, have access to a lot of data, but they are private companies and the data tends to be private, whilst the public administration too produce a wealth of data on their citizens and uh, on their policies. And uh, public administration data is more easy, it's more easily accept- accessible and it helps to build a story and to explain what's happening in the everyday life uh, of European countries and European communities. So we speak today with uh, Martina Zaghi from uh, Fondazione Open Police and David Cabo from uh, Fondazione Sulodana Sivio, which are two members of the European Data Journalist Network. And uh, both Open Police and Sivio can be intended as a public watchdog, which is organization that have in their mission um, the fact that they try to make uh, uh, public administration and governments accountable in front uh, of their readers. So I would like for them to start by introducing themselves and their organization and to explain a bit uh, what uh, their everyday job uh, consists in. So I will start with Martina. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Martina Zavi and I work as a data journalist for Open Police. Uh, Open Police is uh, a non-profit foundation that uh, uh, produces quality information useful to the community. We uh, created uh, through, through years this uh, public uh, um, repository that we update daily, and uh, we, we, we created all of this to, to put uh, all this data in the hands of the community, of the institutions, of the journalists and the researchers, because um, we see it as, as part of the job of being a public watchdog. Um, basically. Uh, improve the comprehension of uh, um, the political decisions, the public institutions, by spreading information. And um, we, um, as, as watchdog, we also, uh, of course, uh, try to uh, watch over the rules of, of our democracy, of Italian democracy, and uh, we, we gain the capability to, to do this uh, through years, uh, Uh, being independent, autonomous uh, from um, any political group, uh, we are um, totally outside the, the, polit- the political spectrum, and uh, um, we use the, this capability to ask uh, uh, transparency. We uh, constantly ask asking transparency to the public institutions, because, um, as you said, um, Italian institutions, um, in, in Italian we don't have so much um, uh, a total transparency on, uh, on the data and so um, it can be sometimes hard to um, allow to access to this data and to understand and comprehend these dynamics. So um, we both try on one side to, um, uh, to make this information uh, related to the public administration and the political decisions and institutions we try to make them more um, accessible, more, um, more s- simpler to, uh, through the use of data journalism uh, tools. And on the other side, we ask for more transparency through uh, public campaigns, through civic uh, actions and data activism initiatives. So basically, this is what we do. Thank you. How about uh, the Spanish case, David? Yeah, hi, I'm David Cabo, I'm the co-director and co-founder of, of Cibio, and, and we are very similar to um, to Open Police, actually, we, we know them, we've known them for a while, and sometimes we, when we met them, we were actually very surprised, like, oh my god, they're like us, <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're our cousins. Basically, we, we started in 2012, Um, our aim was to improve the governance of the Spanish democracy. We wanted to improve the quality of uh, of discussions, to talk more about more policies than politics, let's say, right? So we wanted to, to have better debates. We wanted people to have more information and better information 
so they could vote and they could make decisions better, right? So our goal is to, I mean, and we believe that transparency is an important part of this. I mean, we believe that citizens deserve to have uh, proper information and to have fact-checked information so they can, and, uh, so, so they can make better decisions. So transparency and accountability are a big part of what we do. Um, more and more we become uh, what we call, I mean, we call ourselves a non-profit newsroom, um, which is something still very strange in Spain. When we say that we do journalism in Spain, people still freak out a bit because they're used to journalism being done only in newspapers, not in, uh, in non-profit organizations, um, but we do it. Um, and another thing that makes us a bit unique is that we also do some advocacy around things like, for example, our access to information law or like uh, our procurement law. So we are constantly fighting to have better tools to do our work, let's say. So we fight a lot for transparency regulations and things like that. And, and sometimes we actually have to take the government to court when they don't respect the the transparency law when they we do like hundreds of uh, access to information requests every year uh, because that's one of the big pillars behind our investigations is the information we manage to get from the government and uh, sometimes they don't want to give us information so then we have to go to court and we end up in the supreme court and in parallel we keep telling people what we are doing and we we, we, we lobby to improve the regulations and things like that so so we are quite unique in that sense, in that we combine journalism with other things, but uh, journalism is, is, is basically one of the big parts of what we do, because we we thought, we, we kind of saw that there was a gap in the market when we started, like uh, no one was doing this type of data-driven journalism, and we thought it was very important. So, and uh, for both of your newsroom, uh, uh, data is very important for your everyday job and for producing your output. So, uh, how does it work uh, to relate to public administration with data? I heard, for instance, that uh, uh, you were referring before to several access of information requests that you have to make. And so I would like to start with a question, which is that... Uh, Given that public data is uh, the data that uh, uh, public administration data is the data that the administration collect from citizens, uh, and uh, it should theoretically be open and be accessible by the citizenship, what are the main issues in uh, actually having accessible data that can be used uh, as a source uh, for a journalist story or for an investigation? Um, yeah, on the on the um, access to information, um, we also uh, need uh, a lot of requests on different projects we are working on, and basically the relationship uh, um, our organization has in the relationship with the public administration one of its main core, and uh, um, asking for more transparency on public administration data is one of our main uh, main activity. And we also um, developed um, different tools to, to allow this access. Because, um, for example, we uh, one of the of the project um, more focused on this is um, our platform Open Parlamento. Uh, that is um, a platform uh, that um, that allows citizens, activists, and researchers to track the activity of all the activities of deputies and senators. And it is the only platform like that in Italy. But as you were saying, these are public data. I mean, it's, it's of course a right of the citizens to know what happens, what's going on in the parliament. And so um, we created this platform with the, the most comprehensive source of information. And um, we, we study uh, through this platform many different aspects like attendance to meetings, party switches, uh, uh, and much more. And from the problem of absenteeism, for example, uh, Open Parliament is the only platform in, in which it's possible to track MPs' attendance on a daily basis. And uh, of course, uh, the deputies and senators changing political group. But we also, um, regarding uh, the, the still on the on the representatives, we also study issues like. Uh, um, the respect of the laws on uh, eligibility and incompatibility of the roles. This is another point. 
and um, all the stuff regarding um, the legislative process, basically. We monitor all the legislative process in every aspect. For example, another activity um, is, uh, the, is that we monitor the legislative activity of governments, uh, because in Italy, uh, especially in the last years, um, the parliament, the Italian parliament, has been losing control of its legislative power due to uh, governments progress, progressively stealing the show, we, we can say. And uh, so we started tracking uh, the legislative activity of government, and in particular, um, what we call the second half of laws, that are the implementation decrees. The implementation decrees are uh, these measures that uh, ministries have to adopt um, to concretely implement the laws that are adopted by the government or by the parliament. And this was um, an issue totally uncovered by the, the national media. And, uh, uh, but we, we thought that this, that this is a fundamental phase of the legislative process because, of course, um, it involves the practical aspects of implementing the law. So we started uh, working with the data that were uh, already available, but also asking for more, for more transparency, asking the government, um, in particular to the, in the Office for the Government's Programme, to, uh, to be more transparent on, uh, on this point. And we also um, did a request um, to, the, um, with the, to FOIA, to the Access to Information Law, on this, because, uh, for example, when the, 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 the Conte government uh, was in office, um, the, the website uh, was down, the website with all the, the implementation of this information was down, so we asked for it to come back online and we started asking more data to study, to study this, uh, this topic and now it has a, a, it, it's covered by the, also the, by the national media. So I think this is um, one of the, of the of, of one, one good example of how uh, asking for transparency and um, working on, on public data can really um, shed light on important issues that are in, in the right of citizens to know. To be uh, informed on these on these uh, on these kind of issues, and um, also in, uh, see regarding the, the the relationship with the public administration, we have also um, some project related to the study of territorial data. So this is uh, um, this is more something that we um, we relate with the local public administration, so with local governments and stuff. And we have on these two main projects. Uh, one, one is on the um, educational poverty in Italy. Um, and we, we collect data on um, services uh, related to education, so like schools, uh, but also libraries, uh, green areas, and, and so on. And we study the, um, the presence of these, of these services, services on, on the territory um, to gain attention gain the attention of the public debate and of the public administration on uh, the access of these kind of services, for example, in the south, but also in the most uh, peripheral areas of the county and so on. And um, I mean, we, we, have, we have a lot of, 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 of projects on, on these kind of things, like, for example, we study the, um, the budgets of the local governments on the territory. Uh, we have this platform that is called Open Lunch, where we collect all the, the um, annual budgets of all the municipalities of Italy, always um, still in the, in the, um, with the idea that it's right of the citizens having access to this information because it, it's something that uh, affects their, their life, their everyday life. So this is really some examples of, of what we do. Um, in our relationship to the public, with the public administration and using, using data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on our side, um, actually I'm a software, originally I was a software, I am a software developer. And when we started TVO, actually, it was right at the highest point of a uh, hype around open data. And uh, Obama was talking about it and UK and everybody was talking about how the data was not really owned by the government, it was owned by the citizens, and it made a lot of sense, right? And everybody thought that 
we thought that the government would start publishing information and that this would open a lot of opportunities. So when we started working, I mean, actually our first project was visualizing the budget, the national budget in 2012. And uh, it wasn't easy because it wasn't really open data, but we, but we saw ourselves as a kind of visualizing, we, we thought our role would be to visualize data and to curate data, maybe to distribute it and be like a link between the, the government and, and the journalists, right? Before we became a, a newsroom ourselves. But basically, that that view died. Basically, then we quickly we realized that um, all this talk around open data was not really very effective in the sense that governments were publishing a lot of data or some data, but that not the most interesting things. I mean, yeah, it's fine. You can publish the schedule of the bus in your city, but actually, I want to know who your politicians are meeting with or something like that right? so it was a bit of a distraction and also the quality of the data in the official portal i mean in spain we are very good at um, at playing the the numbers and playing the indicators so we, we were like the number three country in the world in number of open data portals right we, like we had every city had an open data portal and then there was nothing in there nothing interesting at least so there was this huge talk, and, and and but we realized it was not leading us anywhere, and um, and also the quality of the data, the official data is was and is very bad. Um, you were saying earlier that data is the new oil, and and someone said like yeah, it's like oil because it's dirty and hard to refine and 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 toxic or whatever, right? And it's like it is is. It is very, very hard to work with data, with official data, because usually it's very low quality. So all in all, we, we, we evolved from our naive view of open data to a more aggressive and in a way confrontational approach, a more journalistic approach, where instead of looking at the data the government was publishing and trying to do something with it, we would use a more journalistic approach where it's like, okay, what's the topic I really want to cover? I don't know, like public procurement. So then it's like, okay, there is no data. How can I get the data? Do I do uh, access to information? Do I try to scrape a portal? What do I do? Do I advocate for this data to be published? What, what do I do? So that's more where we are now. And actually, we used to be invited to a lot of conferences about open data from, by the government, things like that. And, and, and we always say, and it's still true, that we don't use any official public data, open data data set because the interesting stuff is not there. Uh, all the stuff we do, we ended up having to do ourselves. So, for example, we spend a lot of time uh, scraping official websites. Uh, one big source of information for us is the official cassette. Um, we have one journalist, the co-director, Eva Belmonte, who reads the official gazette every day to do particular stories, but also she identifies like interesting trends or data sets. So, for example, we made one investigation about um, government pardons, like uh, the government can decide that someone doesn't have to go to jail and doesn't really have to justify it or do anything about it, just say, okay, this guy's not going to jail. The, the only thing they have to do is to publish it in the official gazette. So we built a data set of the last 20 years of, of pardons in Spain, a, a data set that no one had. And we did that scraping with, uh, with developing like a program with uh, regular expressions and things like that, technical stuff. Um, and from that, we were able to prove that the certain trends, we were able to prove that certain corruption crimes were pardoned more than average crimes. We were also show how both political parties, the left and the right, they were pardoning politicians, both their own and, and the other party. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, like how, well, yeah, I don't know, like they, they were protecting each other in a way. So all those investigations, we, we could do them just because, because we were the only ones with that data set. Not even the, actually, the, the funny thing is not even the government had that data set because when other journalists would ask them certain statistics about pardons, they would say, oh, actually, I don't know. I don't, I don't have that data, but you can go to this TVR's website where they have the data that you can download it. So sometimes it's that the government wants to hide stuff. Sometimes they are just too useless to actually collect information properly. Um, 
but yeah, basically that means that we cannot rely in official data, data sets very often. We end up scraping a lot. Our latest investigation is about public procurement and the use of uh, emergency procedures to, to buy stuff during the, the, the COVID pandemic. And uh, we have to download a lot of stuff and scrape a lot of stuff. And also, we, and as usual, the quality of the data is very bad. So, so yeah, our role is to push for better data, to scrape, to complain, to do a lot of access to information requests and then publish what you receive. And also, recently, we are trying to collaborate with other agencies, not with the main, not, not let's say not with the ministries themselves, but like we have a number of anti-corruption agencies in Spain. So for example, we are now sharing our data with them, our data on public procurement with them. Because sometimes those independent agencies don't have the skills or the or, or often often they don't have any special access to the data, which is quite sad. So they have to work with whatever is public, which means it's, it's hard for them. So yeah, we are trying to collaborate with the independent, with, let's say with the regulators, or with the overview organisms. But our relation with the main body of government is is not very good, let's say. It's, it's more confrontational. We, are, we, we really are a watchdog. And we, don't, we cannot rely on what they decide to publish. We, we keep pushing them to publish what we want to publish. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, that uh, your two interventions uh, arise uh, one question or an issue at least, which is that uh, you, when doing your job as a public watchdog, you go through at least uh, two main problems, which is the first one is that uh, the government uh, maybe doesn't want to publish the, the data the government has, or when publishing it, uh, it just publishes an aggregated version or a residual one covering the, the true picture behind the data. Whilst, on the other hand, uh, as you said, we have a problem in government not having its own data because uh, it has not, because it's not interesting for the government to have the data, so it is not collected, it is not standardized, and it cannot be compared. So uh, I would say that these, in a sense, make data, even when it's open, not democratically open, because, uh, as you said before, you need to do on the one hand, things that requires technical capability with uh, development or data analysis. So you need to write the script uh, and uh, to scrape the content uh, of a website of the public administration, or maybe you need to have knowledge uh, of the legislation of freedom of information in your country, and then you need to go through that, which is not something every citizen could do. So your organization, uh, are a bridge, ideally, from the public administration to the wider public. But uh, as you both said, more often than not, uh, you need to be confrontational with the public administration, and in some cases, even fill a gap that the public administration has because it is not made public. And uh, uh, starting with these, uh, uh, I would like to ask you if, for instance, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic could be something that changes uh, a bit the situation and that turns the table in a sense that uh, for how I think it's perceived, uh, uh, your work and in general at the journal, it has a high public utility, but uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, the wider public is, uh, doesn't sympathize a lot with the issues that your organization may have, which is the government doesn't share properly the data and the da or the data is not enough. So do you think we might see a, quali a qualitative change uh, in these uh, that maybe gives to the advocacy you do and to the pressure you do to governments more strength uh, because uh, it became clear how public data is important or do you think it's something uh, deeper in how government decide to deal with the entire issue? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually we, we've seen obviously uh, for everybody, it's been a huge impact, the, the, the whole pandemic. I mean, for us, in terms of our audience, it's, it's been a huge boom. I mean, we more than doubled the number of uh, small donors we had. We had uh, record traffic um, because I think every citizen realized how important it was to have accurate information. And because Eva Ibabel Monte, because she was reading the official Gazette every day and she was very 
let's say, very plugged in into the news about the restrictions, what you could do and couldn't do. I mean, for us, it was huge. And I think it made, as you say, it made everybody realize, every citizen realize how important it was to have high quality information. And also, I think it, it highlighted how bad the government is in actually handling information. Because I don't know the, I don't know how it was handled in Italy, but in Spain, it's been a mess. I mean, from the beginning, <laughs> yeah, from the beginning, the, 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 how the government was publishing, first it was the number of tests, then there was the number of cases, then it was people in hospitals, now it's the vaccines. In general, even one year up, because at the beginning you can justify and say, look, come on, we are all crazy, just publish whatever, publish a PDF, whatever. But still, one year after after that, I mean, we are having really bad information in Spain, very bad data. At some point, we had to collect the data about the number of tests from the different regions. We have 17 regions, but it's, it's not a crazy number. I mean, you could imagine the central government just picking the phone 17 times and collecting the numbers, and they didn't do it. Or, or very badly, we had huge number of weird things happening with the data where people don't understand why the number for Catalonia doesn't match with the number that the central government is giving for Catalonia. I mean, there is no traceability of the data. It's all very fragmented. So I, I think it's it, it, it has shown how bad the government often is in handling this. I mean, it was really bad. The, on the good side, some regions really had pushed, I mean, move forward and, and did like their own portals, their own regional information sites that were very good. I mean, there were two or three regions here in Spain that had, at some point, they had dashboards with all the information break, broken down by age or by province, whatever. So it, it has shown, I mean, I think people, and, and, and actually now they tell like success stories about how much traffic they were getting on their transparency portal. That normally is not an interesting site for people, right? Like no one goes to the regional government transparency site. And, and now millions of people did. So I think it has shown how important the data is but clearly there are a lot of issues. Also, and this is just more on the technical side, let's say, of how you, from managing numbers of cases of vaccines, the, the, the skills are very bad inside the government. But also we've seen like bad, bad practices in terms of hiding a lot of reports, not, not so much on the number side, but on the, for example, like the traceability of decisions or who are the experts making decisions or what happened in that meeting where you decided to lock down the whole country right i mean and and that's another thing that people actually are demanding i think it's very very people realize that there are a lot of decisions that impact them being made and and people are asking for this and journalists and it's good to see it and many journalists are doing like uh, not only us many of them are doing access to information requests about minutes of meetings and things like that and the government sometimes is saying no the, the minutes are not approved they're not official whatever or they are hiding like the, the list of people in those meetings and things like that. So I think the crisis has exposed the bad quality of the data management and the, and the bad quality of the governance. And I hope that that will remain and that will be a motivation for people to keep demanding for improvements. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree that in the, the, the pandemic crisis uh, maybe made citizens more conscious about the, the importance of uh, transparency of data but on the side of the government management of, of, uh, of data I, I think it, it didn't improve uh, and it didn't uh, um, promote uh, or yeah, good public practices I mean uh, the government still uh, still have a lot of um, a lot of problems on, on publishing on publishing, uh, publishing data. As Open Policy, we have a huge project uh, on this uh, related to um, COVID-19 uh, because at the beginning of the, of the, of the pandemic, um, uh, the lack in our country, in Italy, of materials such as masks, disinfectant gel, all the uh, medical materials on the virus had to be resolved. So uh, the Italian government uh, um, decided to proceed, uh, notwithstanding all the laws of, um, on vendors, to massive purchases of all the necessary materials without conducting tenders. So as Open Policy, we immediately raised the issue 
that of course maximum transparency uh, on these purchases uh, was needed to avoid abuses. And uh, um, we tried, we, we have created um, a, a platform, an online platform that is called Anti COVID, uh, that means COVID uh, tenders. And uh, we have collected there, uh, selected and categorized all the expenses related to the emergency by all the Italian public administrations, so ministries, regions, uh, municipalities, schools, uh, etc. We use the different sources to get this data. Uh, the main one is ANAC, so also for us, uh, the National Anti Corruption Authority uh, was a uh, big help on this. But the problem was, uh, and still is, that these data are not complete because the government um, did not really um, make, uh, did not really um, publish all the data and they are not uh, open because the, the, we, we made um, more than one FOIA uh, request, access, uh, access to law information requests, but they were rejected. The only um, thing uh, we, we had was that um, our commissioner for the crisis uh, management published some data, but they were not um, downloadable, so you can um, so they were not uh, there was not the possibility to reduce this data, and they left different information. So we we tried to do what we could do with, with the data we had, but of course uh, it's, it's still the same the same problem. Less data, the, the data about something that's so important that changed so much all the, the, the lives of all of us, they, they were not, and they still are not, uh, are not public, are not open, and, uh, and still uh, this is the, this is the situation. We also, um, on the, still on the, on the COVID crisis, uh, we tried to um, analyze all the, um, also other perspectives, so the, the, the laws. Perspective, so we monitor all the laws, the decrees um, about the, the, the crisis management, also on the side of the legislative activity of government, as I, as I was saying before, and also on the subjects involved in the management of the crisis, because uh, um, every every subject, every person involved, uh, we try to see uh, which was they, they they had before, which relationships uh, there were between one another, to um, to, to make all of the all the process of the crisis management as transparent as we as we could, but of course uh, it's something related to the to the government policy of transparency that uh, it still uh, it still has a lot of problems, a lot of it's really critical. Yeah, and uh, on this uh, last issue, rise I know that for instance in Italy there's an advocacy campaigning. Uh, running nowadays, yeah. which is uh, called Dati Bene Comune, which plainly translates in data common good. Uh, and I know that Open Police is a part of the dozens of organizations that are advocating for them. I'll uh, introduce it shortly, then maybe you want to add something, which is that uh, there are several organizations in Italy that are asking uh, to the Italian government uh, to publish the data on the pandemic, whether on the number of cases, the number of tests and of vaccinations. Yeah. Uh, in a, a properly open way, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, up to today in Italy the data is shared only in, uh, ag with aggregated values uh, and sometimes with non-machine readable formats uh, and maybe they're not fully reusable, so this creates several bottlenecks uh, to your organization uh, in your case, but in general to uh, the platform of organization that would like to speak about COVID and uh, to inform about COVID. So how is that thing working? Yeah, uh, we, we signed this, uh, uh, this campaign that is called Dati Bene Comuni, that is um, uh, data public, uh, public common good, data common good. Yeah, asking for more transparency on that because, as you said, for um, putting together all the information and all the data that, for example, we have on the Bandicom platform is uh, something that requires a huge effort to, to uh, citizens, activists, journalists, and we managed to do it, but, um, I mean, it's not, it's not something, it's not something that, that should work in this way, it should be public, open, the government should, 
should do uh, should do this kind of thing and not trying to um, to collect data from many sources uh, from different sources uh, and data that, that, that the still are not are not uh, are not complete at all they, 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 are, they still have problems but we did it through uh, really uh, scraping uh, um, asking for, for, for data to many different uh, in, in, uh, searching for data from many different sources but uh, but still they are they are not complete and uh, the government should work on this but is there some thank you Martina. is there something similar to this uh, in, in Spain that you know David like uh, an advocacy campaign around the coronavirus data to lock the no, government not that I know no I don't think there is any organized campaign as such but there are a lot of people organizations like us or sometimes independent journalists or, or sometimes from mainstream Many people have been doing the, the, the job that the government should do in terms of collecting, for example, collecting the data and keeping a, a, a historical record of it. Because sometimes for some things, the government was just publishing one PDF a day or a week and then deleting the, the old one. So there was no track record of it. So there are a number of people working in parallel and complaining about it in public and, and saying and complaining about the inconsistencies in the data, for example, like how the time series changed at some point and no one knows why and so people uh, that but i don't think there has been any organized effort in that sense so it's more it's been more like everybody doing the same job and sharing it and that has been good i mean i think that's a good sign the fact that uh, that now we assume that it makes sense to do this work and share it and it's it's quite common but it, the, as far as i know there is no organized campaign yeah, thank you. And do you think that uh, this, you both think, maybe first David and Martina, that uh, this behavior from governments is also due to the fact that uh, uh, the, corona, the coronavirus pandemic is still ongoing uh, through Europe uh, and uh, giving access to, uh, to the complete data may also, you know, raise the possibility for independent uh, newsrooms like yours to evaluate the choices from the government, which in the sense that uh, during this period with uh, this data, you did this, whilst in this other period with the same data, you did another thing. And now you can uh, ask for you to be accountable on that. Uh, so do you think there's uh, some hiding behind this gatekeeping of data, sharing just uh, aggregate data or low level quality data? Or do you think it's uh, more due to not being organized in dealing with data uh, at the government level? Yeah, well, I, I don't think it's because it's still ongoing. I mean, I don't think we are going to see that data in one year when this is done. It's just uh, now how much is incompetence and how much is it's bad behavior, that's hard to say. I mean, in a way, the, the, clearly, when you don't have the, the right incentives, I mean, if you know that publishing more data is going to make it more, it's going to make it easier for others to analyze your decisions, that's a tricky incentive, right? Because you are, in a way, it's better for you to be to, to not be transparent or to not help the, the people outside. So, yeah, the, the, I think part of it is a lack of a, a skills in, sense, in terms of lack of resources, lack of a previous practice in releasing a, like uh, that, like, I don't know, like probably many people in the government don't know how to use GitHub or, or, or they don't even think because maybe it's not even allowed internally for internal policies to open a, a GitHub account and start publishing data there. So maybe there is a process that is very expensive to go through to approve a data set. The, probably the, the communications between the central government and the regions in Spain doesn't work very well because in the past they didn't have to do it so quickly because maybe they did it only once a year. So clearly there are new things and maybe the resources were not available, but clearly also there is a lack of incentive to, to fix those problems. I mean, yeah, you can say I don't have the skills like one year ago in March or I don't have the resources, but it's been one year later and we don't see much improvement. And also another thing we've seen clearly is the lack of will to collaborate with, with people outside the government. 
because you could say, okay, look, I don't know how to do this any better, and, or I don't have the workers to do it, whatever. But many of us offered to help, and everybody in Spain a year ago was willing to, to do whatever it took. So the government, if they really wanted to do it, they could say, look, I, I just, I don't know, like I have a 300 page PDF. I don't know how to do this properly, how to do a visualization. Many people would be saying, okay, don't worry, give me that, that stuff. I'll clean it. I'll, I'll maintain a data set because everybody was wanted, wanted to help. So, so sure, there is lack of skill, lack of resources, but I think also there is a lack of political will to be open and to invest in this and to collaborate and with other people. Yeah, uh, I agree. I don't think that uh, um, that uh, the lack of data related to COVID uh, is uh, due to the uh, is a consequence of, of an emergency, of uh, the emergency still going on. I think that, as, as they would say, it, it will not change uh, in, uh, in a couple of years. We, we still won't have, <laughs> won't have this data, I guess. And uh, um, yeah, I think it, it's um, it's, uh, uh, it's both a, a lack of, of will to, to do this, to be transparent, also because maybe um, transparency is often seen by institutions as an obstacle, as something that um, can create, could create problems to the institutions. While on the other side, uh, transparency could, um, could uh, improve the relationship with this, between the institutions and the citizens, because through transparency, institutions have the possibility to communicate better with the citizens, to communicate uh, their actions, their decisions, to, um, to improve, uh, to, to promote the, 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 the civic participation and the participation of the citizens in the democratic life. So it's, it's an opportunity, and, uh, but, but it's seen as an obstacle always. And so it's, it's something that, that, yeah, and on the other side, there is also a lack of skills of, uh, of people that have the, the, the skills to, to do this kind of job and the lack of, of political will because transparency in Italy, for example, is seen as something that can um, damage you, not, uh, not improve your, your position uh, on the, at the eyes of, of the citizen. I, I think that, that's the point. And, uh, um, and yeah, so I, I don't think I don't think it will change, and I, I think we should we won't have we won't have this data, no. And um, yeah, on 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 both sides, and um, yeah, I think the job of the public watch is to keep on asking for more transparency, and keep on trying to work with the, the data we have. That's the point. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, this is uh, pretty disheartening. Let's just hope that the whole attention given to the data by the coronavirus pandemic ends up being uh, a good outcome uh, out of a very bad situation and that uh, lobbying government for opening themselves and sharing the data will be more successful in the future. And in the meanwhile, I would like to thank both uh, Martina and David for having this chat and being here and uh, see you for another episode and thank you again very much thank, thank you. you it was nice